Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Lauren Cantel. I'm the Director of Project Management for the National Network of State Teachers of the Year. And we are so excited to have Leanne Erickson on to share her experience um, with creating a social justice curriculum in predominantly white schools. Leanne is the 2019 Iowa Teacher of the Year finalist, and she was a keynote presenter at the 2019 National Teacher Leadership Conference. And I'm going to turn it over to Leanne. Thanks, Lauren. I, uh, this is my first webinar, so I was reading what to do on a webinar, and one said wear a headset, and I couldn't resist wearing a headset. I just happened to have one. So here I am. You guys, thank you so much for coming. I am going to share my screen with you so that we can start chatting. So let me do that. Um, okay. One of my former students just signed on. Hi, Ben. Thank you for, for coming. All right, so just a quick couple things. We uh, titled this Raising the Cultural Conscious, Creating a Social Justice Curriculum for White Students. And um, thank you, and Stoy, for sponsoring this. And then Undone Education Consulting is a little side project I have that I can talk about later. But I have my contact info up here, and I can share that again at the end. So. Okay, first, before we start, we're going to share our stories, and this is going to be super interactive. So would you take a minute just to make sure that the chat box is open? So if you click, if you don't know where to do that on the more, if you go down to your little control area, there's a button that says more, and then chat. So if you can just make sure that is open, that would be great. And I can't see mine for some reason. So let me just make sure I can. I really want to talk to you. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Um, so sharing our stories. Stories are so valuable to me. So here's one of my favorites. That handsome man with the typewriter tattoo is my husband, Brett. And honestly, he, he is the reason for kind of where I am. And it's largely because he couldn't decide what he wanted to do with his life. So we moved so much. Um, we met in New York City. I was teaching at a huge public school with about 5,000 students. I think there were over 40 different languages combined spoken there. Um, and incredibly diverse, obviously. And then from there, we moved to Chicago for him to pursue a degree. Um, I taught in a school called Collins Academy at North Lawndale that had about 300 students, all of whom identified as Black or African American. Um, which was very different um, than what I experienced in New York. So even though I thought I had this cultural understanding growing up in a mostly white community and then teaching in New York, I really was not ready for what um, Chicago was going to show me and teach me in the way it was going to break me um, and build me back up, right? So from there, we moved to, um, I taught in a private school just outside of Chicago for a little while. And I can tell you more about that story. And then we moved to Ohio for him to pursue another degree where I taught in a really, really rural community. I like to uh, let people know there was a bring your tractor to school day there. Um, and from there, I moved to Mount Vernon, Iowa. So Mount Vernon, Iowa is um, a small town that is sandwiched between um, rural and suburbs, I would say, right around Iowa City, right by Iowa City, right by Cedar Rapids. We have a great college in the area. Um, and our school district is predominantly white. And so in that journey of meeting my husband in New York, I like to show this picture next. I've come to, and I'll tell you more about how, this picture, oh, maybe, there we go. And I like to say I create Brian Stevenson super fans and um, encourage them to change the world. So these are some of my Mount Vernon students when we got to see him speak at um, Iowa State not too long ago. So I share this. I share this because I really think relationships are key to work. We want to know each other and be known by each other. And so we build relationships to change hearts and minds, right? We're not just going to do it on a chat 
in social media, though I do try sometimes, um, and we need relationships to sustain us. And we have this amazing opportunity today to build relationships with each other. So I would ask you right now in the chat box to just write down where you're from and what brought you here this evening, if you would take a moment to do that and we can just encourage and say hello to each other. Pull that chat box back up. I'm struggling to see it, so I'm going to. Oh, there it is. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Ernie. If this is really exciting because the thing is we're creating this really amazing network and I'm really, really excited to do that with you guys. I love that, Steve. Yeah, Steve's gonna get to share. He's our principal if you just joined us at Mount Vernon High School and he is going to get to share uh, Mount Vernon's story regarding social justice. So let me get back here to present and we'll keep going. Okay, so in, in um, line with this idea of relationships, I think one rule of thumb that's really important to start with is to say, do not go at this alone. Do not do this alone. Um, it, it's not sustainable. It's really not because it's hard work in so many ways. It's personally hard because you're trying to unpack your own personal biases while at the same time working, walking students through those while at the same time having potentially pushback from community or colleagues or what have you. So don't go at this alone. And Kalisa Wing, if you uh, know her at all, she's amazing. You should follow her on Twitter. But she said uh, one time, and I'm so I'm stealing this from her, she said, find your champions. And I think it re is really important to find your champions who will work with you, plan with you, learn with you, hold you accountable, which is key. I think it's easy, especially for me as a white teacher to start to feel like I'm doing this great thing, right? I need to be held accountable about where my weaknesses are, where I'm short, being short-sighted and when I need to ask for help. Humble you, right? Our best relationships are with people who are able to lovingly humble us and to lift us up. So please find your champions. Don't go at this alone. And then also invite experts of color into this conversation. This was not something I could have done on my own. I did not have the knowledge, the understanding. I did not had not been listening to people or learning about people's experience. So please, please invite experts of color to plan with, to learn from, to listen to, to teach your class when you're not ready to do so. That has been a, a huge blessing um, in my teaching career is to have experts of color come in and teach my students and me things. Um, I like to consider myself a white student, uh, not just a teacher, but I am a lifelong learner of this and I'm continuing to grow in my understanding. Um, and also, of course, build community partnerships. So we're going to start a little bit by talking about the why behind the work. And I think we've heard a lot of the of disparities. And if you aren't familiar with some of the disparities in education between white students and students of color, I can absolutely send you some more information about that. But I also wanted to talk about some really in interesting statistics about the way that we as a nation are separate in education racially and then the impact of that separateness. So according to the New York Times article, more than half of students in the US attend a school in which 75% of more or more of the population is white or non-white. So despite the fact that segregation is illegal, you can argue that it is alive and well. Predominantly white schools receive $23 billion more funding, that was just in 2016, than schools that are not predominantly white. This can range between $2,000 and $4,000 per child. Uh, 
Um, I can attest to this in a very basic way. When I was at Collins Academy in Chicago, we were limited in the amount of printer paper we can use. Um, and at Mount Vernon, we have an, an open door policy to the supply room um, and, can, and can really get what we need to do our job well. And it's amazing the difference that makes in the quality of education. Um, so I think that's a really, really important and valuable statistic. Finally, this was one that came up. So it says only 29% of students earning degrees in cultural Black or African American studies are white. This was one that came up last year. I did a, um, a talk with a few students, maybe it was two years ago on Iowa Public Radio with a professor from the University of Iowa that said only about 15% of the students that take her um, Black American studies or African studies or literature courses were white. And this was really astounding because I, it reveals that if we aren't teaching our white students how to have these conversations in um, secondary education or that they should have these conversations in secondary education, then they're not engaging them at college. And let's just play the snowball game. If they're not engaging in those conversations in college, then they're not engaging in those conversations in the workplace with their community members, with their friends and family. And I would argue, in fact, that then they are not engaging in those conversations in their own heart. And so we have, that has to be a better number because we need to be part of the conversation. It's a different part that we play, I think, as white people and our white students, but we need to be part, entering into those difficult conversations. I love this tool. This is a really, really cool way to get your kids talking about race and their schools. So check this out. This is a New York Times tool, um, or a ProPublica tool. I think it's, well, I don't wanna say it's from the New York Times, but that's what, how I got there. And what you can do, so it talks about racial inequality and what you can do, and it doesn't have data for everyone or for every school. Mount Vernon actually does not have enough data, but there are schools very near us that have data. So what you can do is you can type in, um, say Iowa City High School. And we'll say that we'll click on the actual high school here. And we get a lot of really interesting data. So this is a great exploratory tool. So we see here in at Iowa City High School, so you can say to students in my high school, in our high school, this is the reality. What can we do about it? Um, it says here, um, white students are 3.2 times as likely to be enrolled in at least one AP class as black students, while black students are 12.4 times as likely to be suspended as white students. And you can see different groups as well, and we have a lot of varied, a, a lot of data here on graduation, on free and reduced lunch, on teachers and resources. You could compare rural schools with suburban schools with urban schools. One thing I found in doing this work is data and facts speak so loudly. If we can teach our students truths, then they're going to start asking, well, why is this a truth? And then we can get into some of the more philosophical things. But if we start with truth in spaces that are undeniable, then the pushback doesn't come in the same way that it would if we just started with ideas or philosophies. So I think starting with truth, helping our students ask the why, behind the truth is a really valuable place to start. And I really love this website. And then you can take it further. My students this year then went out and interviewed teachers and students in our high school and tried to hear the, the stories behind some of, our, some of our numbers and some of our realities. So again, really love that website. In fact, you know what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to do this. I'm going to put it in the chat box for you to have. Does that work? Hold on one second. And I'll have a way for you to get all of these resources. But there is that one if you are interested. So many buttons, sorry. All right. So um, my hope then is that as we start talking about facts, as we start talking about reality, as we start talking about disparity, 
um, we can talk about the why and the why this is so important. And so I think that we have a broken system that we're not talking about. In fact, I would argue that this broken system is what is perpetuating systematic racism because the problem is our white students are heading into the world over isolated as those statistics show and undereducated in how to deal with that isolation. And they're missing out on an incredible experience and opportunity to grapple with the complexity of our nation's history and understand it fully and then participate in ensuring that it is not repeated. This quote always comes back to me and I talk so openly about my own brokenness. Teachers, please be ready to and willing to do that if you can. It is a huge, hugely impactful thing for your students. Um, Brian Stevenson writes, there is a strength, a power even, in understanding brokenness because embracing our brokenness creates a need and a desire for mercy and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy. When you experience mercy, you learn things that are hard to learn otherwise. You see things you can't otherwise see. You hear things you can't otherwise hear. You begin to recognize the humanity that resides in each of us. And this is the why because we all deserve to be recognized as fully human. And the reality is that's not happening. And part of that is because of undereducation in this area. And this, this idea that we can be vulnerable, that we can be broken, that we, can re that we have received mercy and therefore must give it, I believe is the ultimate why behind this work. So in that, and, and I would say too, my own experiences have reflected this problem. And I'll, I'll share a little bit of my story. And if you've listened to my keynote, you've heard this. Um, but I, teaching in predominantly white schools really allowed me to think back and reflect on my own predominantly white education. And so where were the gaps, right? Where were the gaps? I would say I learned about slavery but not the remarkable history of African people or the scope of the violence that they endured because of the slave trade. I learned about emancipation, but not the triumph and tragedies of reconstruction. I learned about Jim Crow, but not lynching. The civil rights movement, but not Amzie Moore or Fannie Lou Hamer, Fred Shuttlesworth. The war on drugs, but not mass incarceration. And when I have these gaps in my learning, it leads me to this very dangerous conclusion that we're all good. The problems in the past are in the past and that's where they belong. And the reality is they weren't that bad anyway. So we don't really have a lot of work to do. And then my experiences as a white person in the United States become the way in which I judge everyone else's experiences. So if racism doesn't make sense to me as a white person, then it just must not be happening because we're all good, right? And that is the dangerous conclusion, but the reality is we're not good, right? We share this common brokenness. And I brought this mindset into my classroom, especially in Chicago. For those students, I was angry. I wanted control. I wanted power because I believed white culture was right culture and not conforming meant not obeying. And it was a disaster because I wasn't ready to build relationships. I wasn't ready to be vulnerable. I wasn't ready to show mercy because I didn't believe that I had received any. With that, I wanna just throw it out there for questions, comments, thoughts. Oops. So let me do that. Questions, comments, or thoughts on the why. You can type them in the chat box if you have them, or you can speak them as well. Lee, I wanted to backtrack just a minute with that wonderful yeah. um, ProPublica link. Yes, please. And just that whole idea of putting the facts out there. Let's share the data. Mm -hmm. First of all, mm -hmm. I love it when students are analyzing data in any class, not just math class or science class. Yes. Um, but then on a broader picture and a much more important picture of leading them to 
have that why. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's one thing that I, I don't like um, when we force a why upon our students. And so I think it's just Correct. delightful that you uh, shared it that way. And of course, to be prepared for the direction that their why might take. Um, right, yes. It's just so poignant to do it that way. And so I just wanted to comment. Thanks for, um, for mentioning that tonight. Absolutely. And Ernie, I really appreciate what you just said, to be prepared for what the why, their why might be. Um, and so I think maybe even before we start having these conversations, we just talk about how to have discourse with people, how to talk to people who might think differently. Um, and so it, with my students, we do a lot of, okay, how do we talk about this? How do we ask good questions? How do we listen to respond rather than just listen to react and listen to wait for a chance to talk? Um, and so we do some educating just on talking first, um, because you're right, the why, you can't always assume that people will come to the same why. And it ends up being really, really beautiful because people start to understand where different points of view come from, where potential misunderstandings or deeper understandings come from. And so they, they get to do that process on their own, uh, which is so, so important, I believe, into really creating change. I, so thank you. I think you just hit on one thing as well. I, I teach middle school. Mm -hmm. So for, us it's, it, for me, when we're talking, and I teach now, I went from teaching in a school where, where I was in the minority to a school where mm -hmm. we were a, a my majority white school. Mm -hmm. And I find with a lot of my students is their understanding of perspective. Yeah. Is missing. Until you start to talk about perspective, to have these deeper conversations, you've got to do the introductory work, the heavy work of talking about why is it important, and I teach history, so why is it important that we look at perspectives? Mm -hmm. And what does that tell us about, you know, the, the history that we have been, that people have been taught, that maybe your parents have been taught, that we see in, in older textbooks or in novels? And yes. then and, and having to pull that out and then having them develop questions that that might bring up around how do we talk about it in a way that people feel safe and mm -hmm. have their voices heard, but also respecting the voices of underrepresented communities. And I Correct. think that's really important. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I talk a lot about with my white students, too, and one of the, the reasons I often hear that they don't engage these conversations is because they are afraid to do something wrong, to say something wrong. And yeah. so we talk, and, and I think we've been acculturated to feel like that that's not something that we should experience. And so we also just talk a lot about getting it wrong and being able to be told that we got it wrong and then moving on and learning from there and that that's okay. Um, I've gotten a lot of things wrong. And um, I've been able to correct, um, to hear, to receive. And that's been a really powerful point of discourse too. So I agree, I agree, it's huge. You've gotta do that, that background work for the why. <clears throat> yeah, Jean just wrote a great, I'm reading it now. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Jean. I also, I really appreciate your point about it, but it's not a partisan issue. I tell, we talk about this a lot. This is not political. This is about recognizing the fullness of people's humanity, and that is not a political issue. And we are not talking politics here. We are talking truth. We are talking history. We are talking justice. And, and asking those big questions has been really powerful. I started a a uh, social justice project-based learning class this year by sitting down with kids and I made them answer the question, what is good? And it was just mine because I said, because if you don't know what it is, if you don't have something that you're rooted in, um, then you're going to have a lot harder time caring about the things that we do. So I think um, that's another way to engage, engage students in just talking as well. It was good, it was a good mind blower. All right, you can always pop something. I can't see the chat box when I'm presenting, but I've got a few other moments where I'm gonna pull it up. So let me go back to presenting. Um, and so this is really my, the thesis that I came up with and I, it's, it's in the keynote as well. Teach a fuller truth 
So let's tell the truth, right? Let's use that fa those facts. Let's use that data. Let's teach the truth. Let's, let's fill those gaps in, especially when we're talking about race in our nation. Of a fuller humanity, right? We want to talk about the humanness of people um, for a fuller joy. So to, to talk to your white students about recognizing these, these atrocities or learning about resistance to oppression or learning about oppression, well, it is hard. It is painful. I walk through a grieving process with kids, but ultimately it's for, for your joy, um, truly, truly, because you have a, a greater recognition and a greater depth of appreciation for trying to know who people are and to know who you are as well. So that is my mantra. Teach a fuller truth of a fuller humanity for a fuller joy. So how do we do that? Uh, for, uh, there's a lot of ways, but I tried to break this down into a few quick categories. So if we're rethinking what we are teaching, I think we have to do a couple things. I think, first of all, we need to rethink our curriculum, all right? Our curriculum is powerful. It tells students who we value and who we think is important. It makes a difference. The person who wrote the whole class novel that we're reading will automatically feel more important than that short story that you're throwing in there, okay? So who are you inadvertently or purposefully saying is important? Important and whose story are we telling um, and how can we diversify that? I think the second thing we really need to do is rethink what we know, right? What we know to be true, our own personal biases. So much of this is about personal learning as well as an educator. At least it was, that was my experience as a white educator. So much was about evaluating my personal biases and rethinking what I know. We already touched on this, but rethinking traditional conversation, um, teaching discourse, teaching students how to listen to and respond to each other, and then listening to our students. I feel like I have a whole other thing about giving up the seat of power in your classroom is powerful. Um, so how can we encourage our students to not just be part of these conversations, but lead these conversations with their peers, because they have a whole audience of people that I don't in the same way. Um, how can they lead us? How can they lead me in the classroom? So really listening to our students. And then rethinking culture. How can our students influence the culture in our school? And we've dealt with racial bullying at Mount Vernon, and um, some of this rethinking culture stuff has led to changes, more instances of reporting um, that have been really positive and beneficial. So really quick, which area do you want to work on and why? In the chat box. Where's the area that you feel like you really want to grow? In the chat box or in your, with your voice. <laughs> which is the area you want to work on and why? For me, it was rethinking culture. I really, now I think I'm focusing on influencing culture. Hey, this is Lauren. Um, hey. Hey, when I was teaching, uh, we were lucky enough to have like a school-wide approach to this where we really got an opportunity to rethink what we know. Um, and mm -hmm. we were led through, you know, implicit bias training and things like that. and that really opened my eyes to be able to look at curriculum in a new light and the culture of the, the school building or, or things like that in a new way. So for me, you know, having those uncomfortable moments were really powerful. Um, yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. You're right. It is, it's powerful and it's hard and in all the good ways. Right. All right. Thank you for sharing, you guys. Yeah. Um, and to Ernie, I'm um, just speaking to Ernie's comment. I think rethinking culture can come from rethinking curriculum. Um, I would say that's where where I started was in curriculum, for sure. It, it is interesting to consider. I, you know, I looked mm -hmm. at all of them, thought, well, you know, here we go, values clarification again, right? I, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'm at a loss of where to start. And so it's almost yeah. like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I, you mm -hmm. know, it's really tough to decide on that. And it probably depends where the school is at, where, where, where students are at, um, to see where maybe your greatest need is. And I think ultimately the other three will influence culture. But then I think there's also some ways that we can really directly influence culture 
um, which is kind of where, and Steve can speak to this more um, later, but this is kind of where I feel like Mount Vernon is headed um, into being really intentionally culture changing. Okay, so just a few steps. Again, this is really basic and we're gonna go, we will go into some detail and time is going so fast, but um, I think you need to partner with experts of color to create a vision for what you'd like to see in your school. And that partner with experts of color, that's not a suggestion, that is a must. You need to do that. Um, it's really, really important. You will have blind spots as a white teacher that you don't even know exist. Um, and then incorporation and implementation. So start small, consider where do you have the opportunity to create change right away. So is it just in your classroom? I started by showing do the right thing in my film class. That was the very first thing that I ever did. And it just led to so much more personal learning and then student learning. Um, what about in your own, in a club or starting a club? So there are some small ways that we can start this. Show your successes. I joke that um, my husband is my publicist. He <laughs> yeah, is constantly finding ways to promote the stuff that we're doing at Mount Vernon. So show student work, host community nights, um, call the local media and tell them what you're doing because the more that you're showing this work um, as positive change and positive um, and success stories of students in your school, the more people that you will be able to bring on board. So I think it's really important that you do show your successes. From there, you can grow your vision, right? New classes, new curriculum, teacher and administrative allies, um, writing grants, getting creative. Um, and I always say, remember to be humble and move forward in grace and love. Remember your own misunderstandings when they existed and fight for people you love rather than against those you perceive to be the enemy because doing that will sustain you in a way that the other will not. This just makes makes you tired and mad. And I've been there. All right, back to it. Questions, comments, thoughts on some of those things. And I've got a whole toolbox coming next. So if you're looking for tools. <clears throat> Anything right now? That's all right. Let's go toolbox. I'm going to leave this chat box up because um, we're sort of going to vote. I want time for student discussion, but here are some things that we can look at before, and we can always go back to this too um, if we want to, if we have some time at the end. But here are some things I can talk about. Um, I have a white affinity group discussion guide. So this would be a discussion made up of only white students um, and how to lead those and different uh, tiered questions to ask and answer. Um, I have standards for social justice courses. So I use the Iowa Core. One of the great standards that we have is the cultural competency standard. So I have written scale learning standards for um, social justice courses. Um, I have African American literature curriculum that examines slavery to mass incarceration with um, talking about the reality that slavery has not ended, but rather it's evolved. So we start with mass incarceration and then we say, how did we get here? So students can really piece together um, those connections. And Ben, who is on here, has taken that class so he can speak about that too. Um, I have a social justice movement planning tool that's really going to use um, some of Brian Stevenson's uh, ways to create a social justice, ways to achieve social justice, and there's a lot of ways that you can plan. Teaching white privilege resources, so I've had the opportunity to teach about, liter just about white privilege in the school, and um, that's been really powerful. Uh, how to develop meaningful experiential learning, and then creating school-wide learning opportunities. So would you go ahead and just type in the chat box what you want, and if we have one that's more popular, I'll start there, and then I'll kind of move around. So I'll give you a minute. Again, these are our options. Where do we want to go? This is our choose your own adventure. Where do you want to go from here? What do you want to see?
All right, keep typing your answers. It looks like we're going to go school-wide learning opportunities and then white privilege. But um, again, keep typing away and I'm willing, I can share any of this with you. Um, so creating school-wide learning opportunities, uh, one of the, the things or my biggest tips, I think, for doing this is let the students really drive this curriculum. So um, what this is, is this is our syllabus for our current, current class that has really been spearheading school-wide learning opportunities. So this is a project-based learning class um, in which students are asking what role do oppressed people groups play in society and what is my role in amplifying the voices of the oppressed. And what they do is they have created, and I don't have any pictures, um, we started, uh, if you're thinking about teaching students how to do this, I guess this is kind of a two-for-one social justice and this, but we started by reading Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, not all of it, just the first two chapters and then looking and examining stories through memoirs. And then they have the opportunity. So um, Mr. C. Brand, who's on here, he uh, adjusted the schedule so that all eighth and ninth graders have a block of instruction about every other week. And so um, various times throughout the year, my care seminar students are charged with um, teaching racial literacy curriculum to all ninth and 10th grade students. And that has been amazingly powerful. Um, we started the first day just by talking about identity to try to get some buy-in um, because the students rightfully said we need them to trust us and we need to build relationships with them before we can start talking to them about um, some of this harder stuff. So really ask the students how to do this. They're so smart and so knowledgeable. Um, and I think you can, if you're in secondary, you can then get those kids into the elementary school. So I would say in elementary school, if you know that your secondary schools, your high school, or even your middle school has classes like this, I wonder if asking them to come and teach as well uh, would be great. We have done that before, and that's been really powerful. We also, um, this will be our second one, but starting in 2018, we did something called the Mount Vernon High School Care Conference. Um, I thought it was really important. You know, I was teaching population is over 97% white, and I thought it was really important for our students to learn from people of color. And so we invited, and it isn't all, but we invited experts of color from various subject areas. So you can see um, Stacy Walker is a legislate. We have legislatures, we have poets, we have a mom of biracial children who experienced some bullying in our school. Um, we've got people who are working in immigration. So just lots of different hip hop artists, dancers, um, civil rights journalists. This was, I mean, this was just amazing. If we were able to have a school wide conversation, everyone in the school attended, we take the whole day to do it and just have amazing conversations um, in which students are learning from people of color. And that really was a game changer. That was a really powerful thing. And I would say this is when afterwards we saw an uptick of, in reporting of racial bullying, students felt safer to talk about race, um, and a lot of the racial bullying that was happening was, was con becoming more condemned openly by students, which was a really important culture shift for us. So if you have the ability to do something like this, and, and, we, were, uh, and we did it on a pretty tight budget, and you can ask Steve more about that, but if you have the ability to do something like this, this is the kind of thing that can really change, um, change the game in your schools. The other thing we did is, um, we asked students to share their learning from a civil rights tour that we went on um, through something called a night of justice driven conversations. And they actually taught our middle school and several, a few other area middle schools. They took their little exhibition learning on the road. Um, and it was really, really powerful. So it wasn't just a little, you know, Wikipedia about what they learned, but it, they were asked to be inspired by their trip, right? So forgotten leaders of the civil rights movement open minds round table and overdue apology. I mean, I can't make this stuff up. They just were phenomenal, right? Art of the unknown, powerful piece. I mean, and, and then you go and say, hey, do you want me to come into your classroom? Do you want me to come present at your elementary school? Do you want my kids to come teach a lesson to, to your kids? And it just do things like that. Reach out and get your kids in other spaces and other classrooms sharing their learning. Don't let their learning happen 
in isolation. Um, any questions about that specifically? White privilege, I'm going to go ahead and give you this article that was phenomenally helpful in when I was trying to unpack white privilege. It's from Teaching Tolerance. It's called What is White Privilege Really? So let me go ahead and pop that into the chat box. Um, and this really helped me to create this presentation for students called Unraveling White Privilege. Um, and I think when you're talking about white privilege, uh, this is just, and I can share this with you and you can just use it, that would be fine. Um, but it, one of the things the article recommended to do is to first start with talking about white privilege, what white privilege is not. Um, so it's not the assumption that everything a white person has accomplished is unearned. It's not the suggestion that white people have never struggled. It does not mean that white people have unlimited access to all things. Because that's some of the, the pushback, even, you know, well, so I, my family worked hard or worked, built their business from the ground up. Well, that, this doesn't take anything away from that, but rather white privilege is having great access to power and resources than people of color in the same situation do. I always use the story of my um, grandparents. My grandparents emigrated here from Slovakia and they worked in the coal mines and the pants factory. They lived a hard life. There's no doubt um, they worked hard. Um, however, I like to ask students, do you know what was happening in the coal mines for people of color? Um, they were being unreasonably arrested and put in there and beaten or killed if they didn't make their quota for the day. It's a very different, we're telling them a very different story of hardship. My grandparents were able to buy a, to build a home, um, to send my father to college. So I think it's really important to help them understand or ask the question, wow, that's really, that's incredible that your family was able to persevere in that time in, you know, rural, you name it, Kentucky, Iowa, whatever. What do you think life was like for black people at the same time? Why don't we look into that a little bit? Um, and so then you can start to see um, where privilege really is. And then there's, they've got uh, some great, just to go really quick, the power of normal, the Band-Aid example is really possible powerful, obviously, power of the benefit of the doubt. And this is all explained in the article, power of accumulated power and wealth. We I talk about that a lot with my family two generations later. You know, I'm a, I'm a homeowner with a master's degree. Um, so we don't have the generational poverty um, that other families do. And then just recognizing that having white privilege and recognizing that it's not, does not make you racist, right? And talking about having to store it, how to store it. Um, and being able to just define some of these things. Kids sometimes throw words around without really understanding what they mean. Um, I use some facts specifically in Iowa. Again, back to the facts. Here's the reality. Let's ask yourself why. We showed some of these to all ninth and 10th graders and had a really profound moment where a student said, I knew there was a small disparity. I just always figured that there always will be. But now that I see how much of a difference there is, I actually believe that we have a problem. And that is huge learning because now that child is ready to investigate that problem. And I always push this book, changed my life. I can totally share that with you, Ernie, or anybody else that wants that. Oh, you know what? I didn't send that chat, that article. A definition I think is really important. I can send this to you. This is the White Affinity Group Discussion Guide and what it has at the bottom of it are a lot of different terms and then where those terms are defined or articles that talk about those terms. So I think that's a really, a really good tool as well. Anything else before we move to Q&A or a word from our sponsors, I like to say. All right, so here we go. A word from our sponsors. I love this. I love these pictures of them. So I'm going to make this bigger so that you can see the amazing people. 
So to start, I'm going to start with Annie Hawker, and I use this photo to, it just is one way that she's so amazing. This is a picture of her um, leading her, the entire staff in yoga um, as part of our wellness initiative. So Annie's official title, title is the K through 12 Teacher Leadership Instructional Specialist. Um, and I have a specific question for Annie that I'm going to throw at her and then you can ask Annie some follow-up questions. But Annie, as District Curriculum Director, you see a broad range of curriculum implemented at Mount Vernon Community School Districts. Where, in your opinion, does curriculum fall short when it comes to racial literacy and culturally responsive teaching? And then what happens in a classroom when culturally responsive curriculum is used and when white students begin to have these conversations? Take it away, Annie. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Leanne, for the kind introduction. Um, first off, when I think about curriculum, I'm, I'm very privileged that my educational leadership program at the University of Iowa, um, when we talked about curriculum, it was always with the lens of equity. So the reason for the Common Core Standards are for equity of outcomes for all of our students. So um, it's not just to make teachers' lives more challenging. It, it, it's because we know it's important that all of our kids have access um, to the same level of learning. Um, when our curriculum falls short um, in regards to racial literacy and culturally responsive teaching, I think sometimes, um, teachers can feel uncomfortable in leading our students in um, tough conversations because they're afraid um, a little bit to be vulnerable and, and to be imperfect. And so a lot of times um, we as teachers are, are too afraid to actually have the conversation or we don't think our students are ready and mm. I'm a former kindergarten teacher for 10 years, and we have kindergarten kids who notice. Um, they know um, what, when um, their friends aren't represented in the books that we read, or the stories that we share, or the history that we learn about. And they're, they have a lot more background knowledge than we give them credit for. Um, I think that that leaning in and learning from our everyday experiences is super important. And that um, representation, um, our, our materials in our classrooms and our books, and um, it's important for us to see ourselves in the characters that we read about. And it's important for us to see our peers and it's, it's very important for us to see people who look um, differently than ourselves in, in, in our books and to connect with them as characters and in people as people and as, as history. Um, I'm very fortunate um, as a child I grew up in a school that was predominantly um, made up I would say my peers identified as Chicano and Chicana so they um, had family members from Mexico. And so I had a chance to discuss and learn with them. Um, and I have a dear friend who is a leader in the San Francisco, Oakland area, um, who was a childhood friend who now um, does this work um, in her community. And so she's all, I'm always um, looking to her expertise to make sure that I'm being culturally responsive and that our, our teachers are prepared. And, and I think it's also checking ourselves for our own biases as teachers, because we all have them and being able to say, hmm, am I, it, am I doing what's best? I've seen, I have some lovely peers and um, when you have culturally responsive curriculum, um, our kids are able to have conversations that um, are kind of scary for them and for you, but they have to speak um, their fears and, 
and they have to tell their own um, stories and narratives. And so um, beginning to have, you know, those conversations. Anybody else? Annie, I'm gonna stop just for time's sake, I'm gonna stop you so that we can hear from Steve and from Ben, and then I'll kick it back to see, um, to have questions, to go back to questions. Um, so Steve, Mount Vernon, as Mount Vernon principal, how has the work we've been doing impacted the student body at Mount Vernon High School? And I think, I, I mean, we talked about this earlier, but a lot of what I hear from other teachers is that they get pushback from their administration. So why should administrators do this in their schools? Gosh, Leanne, why wouldn't we do this in our schools? That's, that's, I guess that's the question I ask myself all the time. Why wouldn't we be teaching um, kids how to be accepting, tolerant, open, kind, willing, helpful? Is that not what our curriculum is based upon? I mean, I guess when you look at, at, at content itself, no, it's not necessarily what it's based upon, but isn't that the type of people we want to create? Mm -hmm. um, so the question I ask myself every day is why wouldn't we want to do this? Mm -hmm. um, so your, your first question about how has it impacted or how has it changed our school? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it's education, so it's ongoing. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a continual, I guess, the right word is battle. It's yeah. a continual battle. It's a continual fight. Um, because the thing I have to remind myself every year is that in, in our school, we're, we're a school of about, I always say about 100 kids per class. Um, so we have 400 kids in our high school. And we lose 100 of our best kids every year. The ones that we've been training for, for four years. And they leave us. <laughs> and they go out into the world and I hope they do awesome things. We prepare them to do awesome things. And we get in a group of freshmen that are potentially, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, they're the biggest bunch of squirrel bags we've ever had in our school, right? And we have to teach them and mold them and shape them into those seniors in four years. So how has it changed us? I think that our juniors and seniors really have started to understand um, what it means to look at the world through a little bit of a different perspective. Um, it's hard in our school because we are predominantly white. That's, that, I, can't, I can't change that. You know, I, there's, no, there's nothing I can do about that. But what I can do is throughout the course of their four years is expose them to experiences, teach them uh, how to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation and as teachers the thing I'm trying to to help you do I, I'm trying to I'm trying to facilitate you to be facilitators in the classroom um, none of us hold the key to all the knowledge for our kids and you said it best earlier we need to learn from our kids mm -hmm. um, and I, one thing that I've learned over the past four to five years is I you know, until I really started listening, I didn't, I didn't, I always thought we were good, right? I always thought, I thought things were going well. I thought we were generally uh, respected each other and we were kind and open to each other. And you know what? For the most part, we were. But I don't even think I knew some of the things that were happening with, with racism in our school. Um, I don't even know if kids told me that the things that were happening. Um, and so what I found out is that um, it was happening. We had to we, we, we had to own it and we had to fix it. And the, the deal is though it's not just a one-stop shop. That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to get across. It's not a one, it's not a one-time care conference, it's not a one-time course, it's continual and yeah. it's a culture. Um, but we have to start by getting kids to to know to know what it is, identify it and then to um, be open to looking at the world through a different perspective and through a different lens and exposing them to experiences. I'll stop there. Um, and Steve, one question that just came up, and so maybe while um, some of the kids are talking, you can respond to this. 
um, in the chat box, but someone just, Lauren just asked, how would you recommend that teachers approach administration to, um, to start the conversation of, of implementing some of this stuff? So if you just think about that for a second, because we, we, I want to respect the time. And if, if anyone wants to stay for a few minutes, I'm happy to stay on and, and answer more questions. But Ben and Bree are here with us and they ha um, Ben has graduated and um, Bree is currently a senior at Mount Vernon High School. So um, I, let's start, and Ben, or Bree is my president, president of our care club. Um, but Ben, let's start with you. So um, how has being in courses that address racial inequity in our country impacted you? So often I hear students say, why weren't we taught this? Um, why do you want to know this? Um, and how have you been impacted? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I went to a school even smaller than Mount Vernon, half the class size, about 50 people per class per grade. And I was kind of taught, kind of what Mr. Brand said earlier, just the greater American story about it's the greatest country in the world. And yeah, we had some bumps along the way, but here we are now, we're perfect. And I kind of believe that it held a really proud sense of patriotism for a long time and as I got older I kind of paid more closer attention and realized that there were more uh, underlying issues that weren't covered in my education and the things that I taught were bad were actually horrifying mm. and that uh, not to say that I was lied to but a lot of things were covered up and it I was immediately fascinated with learning more about people of different cultures. I didn't go to class with a person of color until I was 13 years old. When I was in middle school, uh, the first non-white person moved to my school and he was the only non-white person in the middle school. And uh, so I was just, you know, as I grew older, I became more interested in different cultures. I just wanted to learn, you know, I realized how blank my education have been and I was just fascinated with learning more about different cultures. Thanks Ben. I think what you say, the things that ta I taught were bad were actually horrifying and I think that's a really important truth um, to share with students. Um, the bad was more so beyond bad. Um, it was horrifying and it's important to, uh, to know that in order to honor um, our legacy of oppression and resistance. So Bree, just really quick, can you talk a little bit about um, how being in classes and being part of care has impacted you? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so I actually haven't had a chance to take any of, like, I haven't taken African American Lit yet, and I had to drop your care seminar, but um, I've learned a lot like the past two years from care club and like Ben said there really hasn't been a lot of people of color at our school. Kalia, one of my really good friends, is one of the only people we've had for a long time and just recently we've um, become a lot more diverse but yeah just from hearing you talk and like listening to these kinds of things I've learned a lot about like different cultures like Ben said and every time I hear something I just want to hear more about it. Thanks, Bree. I really want to open it up um, to you guys. And if you if you need to go, go ahead. Can we steal five minutes just for questions? And I'll skip the haters going to hate part. Is that okay, Lauren? Of course. This is your webinar. All right. We're here till 10 o'clock. No. Um, but I, yeah, I want to open it up. I want to open it up to questions uh, for Annie, for Steve, or for Ben and Bree. I have a question for Ben and Bree. As students, um, and not to put you on the spot, but what is helpful for you as students? Like, what can teachers do that's helpful to make like? the room and environment comfortable to have these conversations or for you to feel like safe to have these conversations? Um, and you can type it in the chat box if you don't want to speak. Um, I'm okay with talking about it. I would say the biggest, the first couple weeks of African-American literature 
was just being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, we definitely were feeling each other out for those first couple of weeks. There were definitely some conversations we had that I felt uncomfortable and there were conversations that, you know, I would get angry at and there were some uncolorful things I'd want to say to people, but that was just part of the process. And uh, Ms. Erickson was really good at kind of just kind of letting us go for the most part and just kind of letting us hash things out. And I'd say by the end of it, that was about as close of a class as I've ever had as a unit. Um, like relationally, you mean? Yeah. And like I, we started out on a lot of different teams and we were all just one really close unit at the end. A powerful unit too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with Ben. You just kind of have to ease into it. And the more conversations you have, the more comfortable you'll get with it. Thank you. Steve, do you want to answer that question about um, approaching admins to start this work? Yeah, I did put a couple things into the okay. uh, chat box, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll speak to it a little bit and you can, you can help me out on, on where things fit. I don't, I don't claim to be an expert on anything. I kind of just claim to try to keep the school moving forward. Um, but I, I think one thing that, w number one, I, I find it hard that when, when people approach me, I guess, I mean, truly, Leanna, you can agree or disagree. I, I think you'll agree, but like my, I think one of the goals that I try to have is I try to find a way to yes. I mean, if teachers want to do it, we try to, we try to figure out a way to get there. I don't try to figure out a way to stop it. Um, That's a good word. Because I think that teachers um, have such great ideas and they need to, they need to be able to have a place to, to go forward. Um, and to, to help students. Uh, but so I guess if you're approaching an administrator that, that just is closed, I don't, I don't have a bunch of great ideas for you, except for um, bring, in, bring an idea, bring, bring data within that idea, and um, try to figure out exactly where it could fit within the curriculum of, your, of the courses that you're teaching. I mean, there, ha there has to be places in, you know, especially within the humanities, um, you know, within English and within social studies and uh, that, that it has to, that there has to be, you know, within the Iowa, for us, the Iowa core curriculum that it's going to fit. Um, so do a little bit of research, find those places, find those places that fits and um, bring that idea, bring that data and, and hopefully, hopefully they'll try to find a way to yes. I think also if you you have authentic experiences that you want to provide for your students and connections that they can make um, to other schools and places, I think that's a good way to approach it too. I was just responding to Eddie's question, which I think is such a good one. Um, and now I can stop typing and, and just say, um, I think we're moving in the direction of incorporating other groups. Um, I think we have to talk about our racial disparities because it's such a huge issue um, and it's one that students don't get to talk about um, a lot. And so we, we focus uh, unapologetically there a lot. Um, and then we have some other spaces where we do some other things. So this year's CARE seminar is exploring um, various people groups, including Native American, Chinese American, and impoverished communities, and Mexican American. And our CARE Club addresses wider issues too. Um, they have been to conferences about sex trafficking. They are currently working on how to um, better incorporate our students with learning uh, differences or with physical differences into our community. Um, so there are some of those things happening as well. Looks like no more questions. If I, I'm just gonna share screen really quick and then Lauren's gonna wrap up because I just wanted to show you um, and if you're interested in reaching out, we can talk more, but um, one of the things that was, I know was important to people were um, talking about um, pushback. And so I've got my little haters gonna hate slide, let's love them well and know when to let them go. Um, I would say relationships first and focus on students. You probably won't change someone's mind in the um, you know, response column of a, social media of a Facebook chat, but you know what, 
I certainly have tried. Um, so I can talk more about that. Um, just again, really quick, here's my contact information. So you can email me. Um, I can give you, uh, provide you a link to the conference keynote. And if you go to um, undoneconsulting.com and sign up for, um, for uh, what do you call it? Sign up for, uh, to be part of the group. You know what I mean, to get updates and stuff. I can send you copies of all of my resources. You can also email me there um, or send me a message on Twitter. So thank you guys so much for being here. I think we have an incredible opportunity to shape um, our future as we engage in these conversations with our students, as we teach our white students how to store their privilege um, so that they can learn, learn from, be led by, partner with um, people who are different than they are. So thank you so much. I'll turn it back to Lauren. Thank you so much, Leanne, for this wonderful webinar. And it is being recorded. It will be sent out and we will share contact information and everything like that. Um, I just wanted to do a quick shameless plug. Um, Enstoy is offering learning opportunities. We have virtual master classes coming out November 4th. We have instructional strategies that promote educational, or I'm sorry, not educational, emotional and intellectual safety. That's led by Darby Valenti. Um, and then we have a master class with Katherine Bassett and Rebecca Milwaukee titled Teacher Leadership, Pathways, Strategies, and Inspiration. So if you're interested in either of those, go to nstoy.org slash learning opportunities. And then our conference this year is in July in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, July 7th through the 10th. And again, Leanne, um, Annie, Steve, Ben, and Bree, thank you so much for your knowledge and your perspective, and we appreciate you. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>